The following program is a Podcast One.com production. He started in a small town in Texas. Worked his ass off to become one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. We're going to take care of business tonight, and that's the bottom line. And now he's dominating the world of on-demand audio. And he's doing it for the working man. This is a damn good outlet for me to spew the bullshit off my brain. This is the Steve Austin Show. Unleashed. 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 All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the mean streets of Los Angeles, California today. And I'm coming to you right next door to 316 Gimmick Street. My rental crib at 317 Gimmick Street out here in Marina Del Rey, California. Hey, I got a damn good guest for you today. I'm talking to my old buddy, Bruce Pritchard, of one of the latest podcasts to come out. Podcast has been out for about six months and it's on fire. You get a chance to check out and uh, listen to me and Bruce shoot the breeze a little bit. His podcast is called Something to Wrestle With, and he does this with his buddy, Conrad Thompson, where... Uh, you, the fans, email in questions or topics, and they break it down. And Bruce gives you all the insight and 411 of what happened back in the day. Conrad is a research guy and uh, poses questions and uh, devil's advocate to uh, Bruce's thoughts or uh, comments. So anyway, Bruce Pritchard is my guest today. We're just going to shoot the shit, talk a little bit about the Royal Rumble, a couple of the matches that happened there, the creative process of what goes into how to write a Royal Rumble, and just talking about what it takes to get over in general. I'm sitting there shooting the breeze with Bruce Pritchard. Hadn't talked to him in a long time, and it was good to catch up with him. I'm so happy he's got a very successful podcast, so check it out. We'll drop the details in the body of the show, how to check out his podcast, and it's something to wrestle with. My guest today is my old buddy, Bruce Pritchard. Before we get to Bruce Pritchard and my conversation with him, let me bring you guys up to speed with everything I got going on. Well, the remodel continues over at the house, 316 Gimmick Street. It's starting the building process. Everything's coming uh it's coming along okay. They had to uh do something with the floors. The floors weren't lining up and we had to trim a little bit off to get the floors leveled and the hardwood floors came in, everything looks good, that's fine and dandy. They're over there beating the shit out of something. I don't know what they're doing, but they're making a ton of racket. I'm over here in the furthest bedroom away from that house, so I can try to record in some peace and quiet. Anyway, the remodel is going fine. Hopefully by April, I'm back at 316 Gimmick Street in my podcast studio, which will be in my office. Fuck, I can't wait. Hey, I told you guys I had a little half rack, a little power rack, built for my garage over there so I can uh, stick around the house and not have to get out in Los Angeles traffic and get my workout in. I'll tell you what, that's about the smartest decision I've made in the last year. When I go down to the Broken Skull Ranch down there in South Texas, I got a power rack and I got dumbbells up to 100 pounds. I got a dual pulling machine and two benches. Just basically all the basics that you need to stay in shape. Well, now I have even a smaller system in my garage over here, so the workouts are coming around pretty good. That layoff that I took down there at South Texas with Ted Fowler 361. Drinking down the whiskey and the Broken Skull Ranch margaritas was all fine and dandy. But I put my workouts out on the back burner, and now I got my workouts on the front burner. Basically just hitting every body part about, you know, once every six days. I'd like to say I hit everything once a week, but I got a kind of a tendency to jump ahead of schedule because I don't like having days off. But you have to have a day off every now and then. But anyway, now it's a process of I got my little bike moved in here to this bedroom I'm podcasting from. I'll start kicking in the cardio. And I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what CMT is going to do. They're going to green light season five for the Broken Skull Challenge. We're going to be back out there in Agua Dulce, California. I go back to last week's uh, last episode with the women finishing up and just totally destroying the place in Candace, five-year Marine. Uh, ended up topping everybody, walking off with $25,000 of prize money for beating that skull buster uh, in the final round. It was an absolutely epic performance. So 
Uh, it'll be interesting to see if we get another season out of that. I would like to uh, hope that that show is good enough to get another season. I think it is. I know the people over in the U.K. off Dave TV have really been enjoying watching that and looking forward to getting back out there with those guys. And speaking of Broken Skull Challenge, coming up next week, if you guys will remember my men's champion for Jesus Christ the past couple seasons, Hunter McIntyre, the sheriff, He's coming down to 317 Gimmick Street next week. And we're going to talk to this young man about his training, where he comes from, his background, what he's thinking uh, while he runs the Skull Buster, his focus. How did he prepare for the Skull Buster? How does he prepare for all the Spartan races and all the crazy races that he travels all over the world doing? This guy is one of the best athletes in the world at what he does. So you're going to get an inside look uh, inside the mind and inside the training of one of the elite athletes on planet Earth. And the damage and the havoc that he wreaked out there on the Broken Skull Challenge course was just astounding. And people couldn't believe that no one could come close to this guy. Well, that's how good he is. And that's how badass he is. So we're going to find out where he comes from, what his mental makeup is, and how he got to the level that he got. And there was that one time I was talking about this on an interview uh, that I did to promote the last episode of the show. Uh, we couldn't show this on television, but, you know, right there uh, before each round, Hunter was psyching himself up, and he'd be out there like, Motherfucker! Motherfucker! Come on! Fuck you! Fuck you! Motherfucker! Come on, motherfucker! And he would just be doing this between the rounds and you know we ain't got the cameras rolling we, we probably were rolling cameras but we didn't show it on tv but i'm telling you man what you see on tv is the real mccoy it's authentic full-blown real deal competition we didn't show that psych up part because you can't put that kind of stuff on television but we're going to talk to him about it on the podcast when he comes down to the house next week and i'll tell you what it's it's a way for him to psych himself up for him to get into, you know, where he needs to be mentally to take on the course with the challenge at hand. But I would dare say that also had uh, a psych out effect on his opponent. I don't know if that was intended or not. We'll ask Hunter as a byproduct of trying to get himself ready. But I'll tell you what, I've been around a lot of competitive people. I've been around the business for a long time. I've been around competitive powerlifters uh, and stuff like that. People that are getting ready to do feats that require incredible strength, focus, durability, or uh, stamina. And I'll tell you what, man, this kid is an amazing athlete, and he's going to come by next week. Paul Rome was coming to the show. Uh, Tom Finn, one of the strongest powerlifters in the world, is coming down to the uh, – 317 Gimmick Street in the next couple of weeks. He's been training over at Super Training Gym when he comes down to Sacramento area. I got a couple other cats that are coming over to the show that I can't think of right now. But, shit, man, we're clipping. Uh, everything's going good over here. Hershey the Wonder Dog just got finished going back to the veterinarian office for her checkup. If you listen to the podcast, you know Hershey had uh, was diagnosed with walking pneumonia. And she's been on uh, antibiotics now for two or three weeks. Maybe it's two and a half. She just got a chest x-ray. She's showing improvement. Some of the little gimmick cells, things have disappeared. Uh, most of the fluid is gone, but she's still on antibiotics for about another two or three weeks. She has seemed to be showing a little bit more energy. She seems like her spirits are better, but she's not out of the woods yet. So Hershey the Wonder Dog is on her way to making a full recovery and getting back to normal. Man, I tell you what, I took Hershey and Mula on a walk yesterday around the block. And when I take those dogs around the block, I got them on those 25-foot retractable leashes. And I can only take one block with Hershey because at 12 and a half and with the walk and pneumonia, she blows up. So I drop her off at the house. And then I take Mula on another walk that lasts about 30 minutes to try to get some of that energy out of her. When you have a dog, you got to give that dog exercise. And Mula's a silver lab, and she's three and a half years old, and she's got a shit pile of it. So I took Mula on that walk, and we came back. And, man, as soon as I came into the house and walked into the kitchen, there was Hershey. The trash can was turned over. Trash was scattered out all over the goddamn kitchen. Her, she was neck deep inside the trash can, and I yelled at her. I said, Hershey, 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 goddammit. 
and she don't hear very good these days, and her head was inside the trash can, so finally she realized that her ass was in trouble. So anyway, I was disappointed, to say the least. Didn't give her a spanking. She's too old for spankings, and she's just getting so goddamn old. So I got my broom and my dustpan out, cleaned up all the bullshit, scolded Hershey, and... I guess she's recuperating just fine because she can get the goddamn trash and make a fucking mess. She's got to be feeling better. Anyway, believe it or not, that's all that I have going on in my life right now. Well, I'm lying to you. I got a bunch of shit going on right now. Can't really talk about it, but uh, I'm going to bring you this podcast right now. We're going to open it up with Bruce Pritchard, and we're going to start talking about pro wrestling because that's what it is. But before we get to Bruce Pritchard, y'all know that Valentine's Day is coming. Shit, it's 12 days away, and this is going to be the year that you become the Valentine's Day hero. This is the Valentine's Day that she ain't never going to forget because you were on your game and ordered her up a gigantic bouquet of flowers from the books, and you had to deliver it on Valentine's Day, not the day after. And it's a win-win for you because she's happy with her huge, beautiful bouquet, and your wallet's happy because you didn't have to go broke buying flowers. Books flowers started just 40 bucks. So go to books.com. That's B O U Q S.com and use my promo code Steve to save 20% off your order. And when you register at books.com, you'll also get free weekday delivery. And with Books Flowers, there ain't no hidden fees, no care and handling fees. They ain't going to try and upsell you on a bunch of other stuff. What you see is what you get. Books flowers are grown on eco-friendly farms and cut fresh, so the flowers last longer, too. They have farms on the side of volcanoes and all along the coast of California. It's farm-fresh flowers right to her table. So be the Valentine's Day hero this year. Order flowers from Books.com. That's B-O-U-Q-S dot com. And use my promo code Steve to get 20% off. Get on it. Books.com. And use the promo code Steve to save 20%. And remember to register so that you get the free weekday delivery. The Forbes interview from Podcast One just launched with the king of podcasting, Adam Carolla. On February 1st, we're dropping a new show. It's called Forbes Under 30, where we talk to young entrepreneurs, hosted by me, Steve Goldblum. It's interesting because when you're a creator, that never leaves you. You always have this urge to want to create. Like, it's just who you are. You like... He liked the girl from wreck it Ralph. She knew she was a driver the whole time. That's Martellus Bennett, one of our first guests. Who knew this NFL star was also an artist? He's that and much more. Subscribe to Under 30 on iTunes now. And be sure to give us a rating and a review. Hey, man, I'm sitting here talking to Bruce Pritchard. He just came out with a podcast a couple of months ago. Him and, uh, what's his Conrad name? Conrad Thompson, yeah, with the first Conrad family Thompson. mortgage, man. Shit. Yeah, God damn it. Sorry about that. Did my research, but uh, the Something to Wrestle With podcast has really taken off. It's been lit on fire. How long have you been doing this thing now, Bruce? Six months. What and made you scary. finally decide to take the plunge to get in the podcast business? Because, hell, I thought you should have gotten to one a long time ago. I'm glad to see you're doing it and glad to hear you're being so successful with it. Well, you know, thank you, man. It's I never in a million years. If you had asked me a year ago to do a podcast and had said to me in a year you'll be doing a podcast and you'll be averaging a half million people listening to your voice a week, I'd have laughed in your face. But uh, Conrad Thompson, I, I've been working with Conrad and First Family Mortgage for a while doing some business stuff with them. And we would always talk about – he would always ask me, about things in the business and he would always start off with hey man you know what happened when uh this this happened and i would tell him stories and we're sitting there one night and he looks at me and says bruce that's a podcast and i said fuck you i'm not doing a podcast man i'm not going to share this kind of stuff he says no that's a podcast it'll, it'll, it'll work and finally i said i'll do it if you do it with me and he did and that's our format we don't do guests we pick a topic. I do a uh, a poll on Twitter that goes Sunday and Monday. We let the audience decide what the subject matter is, and then we 
we go from there and we, he dissects, Conrad does all the research. <laughs> all I got to do <laughs> is sit back and tell stories. And so I don't have to worry about finding 52 guests a year. I just, I got 44 years in this crazy business that I can go back on and, and try and hit recall on some of them. Some are a little fuzzier than others, but it's good. You know, sometimes when I talk to like a Jim Cornette or somebody like that, a guy who booked, uh, ter- you know, different territories, a lot of what they did is documented because, you know, they have all their notes from all the sessions, all the shows, records, and, and it's a right. good way for them re- to reflect and remember all that stuff. For me, myself, man, you and I are real close in age. You got me by a year. But God damn it, dude, I've been hitting the head with so many steel chairs. And, and, and take that with a grain of salt. I just always just kind of... Uh, fuck around and, and kid with that but dude my memory just ain't what it used to be and i always tell these young kids I say hey man whatever you do take you make you a daily journal a weekly journal this that or whatever so you can document some of this shit because you know worst case scenario i mean you just have a bunch of shit down that you could pass on to your kids someday best case scenario you might have you know a number one bestseller because you can r- recall everything that you did i came out with the stone cold true shit a couple years ago and i never even want to write that book bruce it was when I was coming back from walking out, taking my ball and going home because they wanted to job me out to Brock Lesnar in Atlanta. And I said, hey, fuck you. Bad way to handle it. I've admitted that is the worst decision I ever made in my professional career. But when I try to remember some of the shit that I hear you talking about, because you've been on my podcast a time or two, and you recall all this stuff with such clarity, how have you retained all this bullshit? Because you didn't... <laughs> Dude, you were one of the boys. You were brother love. You grew up in the business, but you didn't take all the beatings. But you got out on a party scene a little bit. How do you retain <laughs> all this shit, man? That's my question. Well, the uh, first of all, I used to take a lot of notes. I have practically every single legal pad from 1986 until present. I just save them. I. I threw them in a box and I found them when I moved a couple years ago. I have all that shit, but the recall is on things, how, how they affected me, how I remember it. And and if it affected me, I can't tell you the finishes of certain matches or anything, if that was just a part of the job, but if it was something unique that affected me in in a weird way, then I, I can recall it. If I had a, a strange encounter then I recall that. And that's what I, I tap into. It's not necessarily, you know, on uh, March 3rd, 1981, this happened at such and such a time. I couldn't, yeah. I can't tell you dates and give you close time frames, but <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, that's just perception. And, and my recall over the last probably 10 years is a little shaky at best. How does uh, does Conrad ever, ever have to kind of jar you to get some stories out of or maybe something he said kind of sparked? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is how they went down. Oh, yeah, definitely. His his research, see, he'll go back and he, he does research through the dirt sheets and stuff like that. Right. So uh, most of the time that's incorrect and rumor and innuendo. So when he triggers that, then I have to go and go, no, 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 that ain't how it happened. That's bullshit. And I'll call bullshit on him, but it'll create sidebars of, oh, yeah, well, hey, this happened here and, gotcha. and, and go on. Like we just did a show last week on Kurt Angle, and one of, the, one of the sidebars is when Kurt first came in and he was working with my brother Tom in the performance, the performance center, which was a ring in the warehouse <laughs> over there at 120 Hamilton Avenue. <laughs> but we brought Dory Funk Jr. in to do a Funkin' Dojo. And Kurt gets up. Kurt's been training now for probably two weeks total. And Kurt tries his hand at his first ever promo. And he gets up and he talks about, ladies and gentlemen, I am the Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle. And I'm this and I'm that. And I was NCAA champion. I was this champion. I was that champion. And it was the stereotypical 1970s babyface promo that in 19, late 1990s when you were going around kicking the boss's ass was the best heel promo I'd heard in a long time. 
because everything he was saying was true, but I hated him for it. Right. And so I made the comment to the whole group. I said, you know, guys, I said, you just heard one of the greatest heel promos ever heard. And Dory Jr. was appalled. Because he was like, "That's he's a baby face. My God, look at his credentials. I said, but he's a heel. I hate him for those credentials. And it was, so we get off into those kind of tangents <laughs> where I just kind of go off. Okay, speaking of uh, Kurt Angle, he's going into the Hall of Fame this year in the 2017 class down there in Florida. I remember that kid when he first came in. Obviously, you remember him sooner than I uh, got a chance to see him. And there was one time, shit, way back in the day, was in Jacksonville, Florida. And, you know, back in the day, you know, we used to go do those Monday Night Raws. It was a whole different setup. You had the production truck. You had your semis out there hauling all the shit around. It was always a big production. These days, holy shit, you know, it's 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 about 10 semis, and, you know, all the guys got buses and stuff like that. But I remember back in the day, you know, Taker would have those, uh, what, what what was that shopper, that Titan motorcycles or something like that? Yes. He used to ride. Yes. Yeah, he had that deal exactly. with him, and he had given me permission to be able to, you know, if I to ride one of his choppers around in the parking lot i had undertaker's blessing that i could just kind of 15 20 minutes skirt around the parking lot or we'd be there in jacksonville a couple of lawn chairs all the guys out there getting some sun before monday night raw and uh here comes kurt angle he introduces himself he's making the rounds and i saw him work that night and god damn you know he was having those bust ass great matches Almost from day one, and I, I've t- said this before, I've never seen anybody pick up the business as fast as him. As long as you've been around the business some of the, and you've been around the best of the best, have you ever seen anybody quite like him? No. And we had Sean Stasiak, who was starting about the same time that Kurt started. Sean was second-generation wrestler. His dad was a pro. But he was also an amateur wrestler. So you think about an amateur wrestler that spends his entire life trying to stay off of his back. Sean had trouble taking a flat back bump. Kurt, no lie, first 15, 20 minutes was attacking the mat like a pro. Right. And I just remember watching that going, holy shit, this guy has got it. And his work ethic and training was beyond reproach he was amazing what was his uh deal about finally wanting to get out of the wwe i mean, it seemed like the pressure cooker was on him maybe he's going through some bad times but he wanted to get out of the wwe and he ended up in tna he was he was having issues you know and and he's documented this and he's talked about it but but he got into the painkillers the muscle relaxers and he just got into it in a bad way and it, the pressure got to him, and it wasn't the same Kurt Angle that we have today or that we had in the beginning. So he just was in, he was in a bad place at the time. But uh, obviously, well, I mean, Jesus Christ, if there's anybody deserves to go to the WWE Hall of Fame, it's Kurt Angle. And it's surprising now that the guy has spent more of his career in TNA than he did in WWE. I know, isn't that nuts? But... In WWE is where he was made, my opinion. Absolutely. And and I think when people look at Kurt Angle, they still associate him with the WWE and the three eyes and that's that's the Kurt Angle that I that I remember more fondly. But you're right, he spent more time in TNA than he did WWE. Man, when you when you sit there and uh, we're talking about the Hall of Fame, let me pick your brain on this uh, for a second. Something to wrestle with is a podcast led by Bruce Pritchard, along with his buddy Conrad. Uh, so here's something to wrestle with. We're talking about the Hall of Fame. Uh, old school guys, a couple of tag teams that come to my mind, Rock and Roll Express and the Midnight Express. Man, I dare say throw, throw the Fantastics in there, but let's talk about the Rock and Roll and the Midnight. Dude. You're a student of the game. You're a fan of the business. You grew up in the business. If there's anybody that ever deserved to be in the Hall of Fame, it's it's Midnight Express and Rock and Roll Express. I agree. So will they ever get in? What's the voting process? Who's picking all these people? You Because here's the thing. <laughs> for, for those of you who don't know Bruce, and, and, and I'm sure 99% of my audience does know uh, Bruce, but Jesus Christ, how long were you inside the network uh, of, of WWE? Not the WWE network, but just you were there for a while, then you left and you came back. But total years on the creative force within that company, how long? 22 years. 
Motherfucker. Okay, 22 years. You, you've you been around the Hall of Fame for a while. How do they select those guys? Who does it? Well, early on, we would submit to certain people in the company, the writers, uh, TV folks that had been around for a while, uh, magazine people back in the day. Send a list. Send some people that you think would be Hall of Fame worthy. And I think we would limit it to 10 or 20 people. But everyone would submit their lists, and we would whittle it down from there. But then it would kind of go into no man's land. And by no man's land, all of a sudden, Vince would come in and say, All right, pal, this year in the Hall of Fame, we're going to (laughs) do... And he would read out his list. Mm Mm-hmm. And sometimes we would debate it. Sometimes we wouldn't. Early in the early days, and I say, I'm going to say early days, but let, let's call it um, late 90s, early 2000s. The, the name that was always on every list was Howard Finkel. And he would always get passed up. Dusty Rhodes, always get passed up. And it was frustrating because there was never a rhyme or reason as to why uh, Michael Hayes was another one in the Freebirds that would always get n- not yet. They're not ready for it yet. Not it's not their time. And I'm like, well, if not now, then when? <laughs> and if it just would, it's kind of subjective. And then out of the blue, you would be sitting there, and uh, we're putting Vern in this year. <laughs> Was he on anybody's list? (laughs) And because I would get all the lists, I would get people's submissions and I would go through and try and weed them out and say, okay, we got so many votes for this guy. So many votes for that guy. I think that if they were to essentially take 20 top guys, 20 guys that are not in the hall of fame and whether you put it online, however you do it and open it up, to the fans be more transparent and i think it would be a little bit more popular because sometimes you get a few head scratchers every now and then i was waiting for you to say head scratcher because i was going to say the same (laughs) damn word and so yeah and and when you get those head scratchers it's kind of like come on man how legit is this because you want it to be in in a business that is a a complete work there is true excellence, and, and there's there's drawing power, and there's performance. But when you get those head scratchers, it kind of kills it for me, and I'm in it, it. It's I go back to the one name that I feel that that is missing in the old before a few years ago. You would point to Bruno San Martino. Well, Bruno's not in it. How in the hell can you have a Hall of Fame if you know Warrior's not in it? How do you have a Hall of Fame? But I look at guys like Ivan Koloff. Right. Who made Bruno, who beat Bruno, who was a huge name everywhere he went. Top guy everywhere. But he made the WWWF. He was a top heel, man. He was a badass. Plus, he could go. I mean, you know, like you said, he he helped. He made this guy. He beat this guy. But yeah, he could flat out work his ass off. Oh, yeah. And if it wasn't for him, I don't know what kind of career Nikita would have had. No shit. And, but a lot of guys that he was able to make in the process. Uh, Koloff was the kind of guy, no matter where he went, who he worked with, he was on top. Yep. And he drew serious money. He could come into Houston and work with Brody, work with Dusty, uh, work with whoever, just right on top and drew every time. Because he had strong promos, strong work ethic. His matches were great, very believable. But I don't want to shit on anybody, but some of the guys, you sit there and you go, hmm. Right, that, right, right. He's not in, but but he is. Um, I'm glad Savage got in. I'm glad Kurt's getting in. And I, I think that, you know, you mentioned how we got off on this tangent, Rock and Roll Express. And you go back to the early days in Mid-South, the Rock and Roll Express and the Midnight Express, that here you had two teams and guys in a territory that was traditionally big men. Yep. That set that territory on fire. 
and outdrew all the big guys. And they did it on their work. They did it on their charisma. And uh, I have to say that they did it on Ricky Morton selling. Right. So are they deserving to be in the Hall of Fame? You damn straight they are. And you look at what people miss, too, is how they were made. They came into the Mid-South and they worked with the Russians, uh, which was Nikolai Volkov and Barry Darso as Crusher Khrushchev at the time. And these guys were beating the shit out of everybody. And as tag team specialists, Ricky and Robert came in and they told the story one-on-one, you know, the rock and roll express. I mean, if you were to put Ricky Morton against Nikolai Volkov, Volkov would squash him, but the way they team in and out and the tag team specialists that they are, my God, they can beat anybody and the double drop kick. And man, they just were different. And Ricky sold his ass off and good God, the girls, the girls loved them. And the kids came out and the, you know, even the, the rough, tough guys were kind of like, well, yeah, they're pretty boys, but God damn, they're pretty damn good. <laughs> you know, and it worked, and it worked, and it worked everywhere they went. Yeah, it seems like uh, just because so much time has gone by, you know, you can't say, well, it's not their time yet. It's not their time yet. God damn, they're two of the best tag teams in the history of the business. And there's like, it's not like they're the sexiest picks you can make. But... Those two teams ought to be in there along with Cornette. And, I, you know, if you're going to put Midnight in, I think you got to go Loverboy Dennis Condry, beautiful Bobby Eaton, and Stan Lane. I never really, yeah. really see the Norvell Austin. Wasn't that another guy that was uh, in a formative Norve- Well, Norvell was a part of PYT, the Pretty Young Things. Okay. And I, yeah. Yeah. And so, but anyway, I, those but those three guys, along with Cornette, should should be in the Hall of Fame without a shadow of a doubt, and sooner rather than later. I agree, and Cornette is is another one who probably because of his mouth, it, it probably won't be for a few years. But I hope that Jimmy. You also look at everybody else that has said horrible things about the company over the years that they've put in the Hall of Fame. Get over it. Uh, his contributions to the business, he being Cornette. Come on, I mean. How much did you buy into Cornette back in the day? Because you're only a year older than me, and you you grew up watching Houston wrestling, but we were getting the same stuff because we were were 100 miles from each other. That goddamn Jim Cornette would get on TV, and I would think, is this son of a bitch ever going to shut the fuck up? And he'd just keep going on and on and on with that tennis racket. They'd load Mm -hmm. that thing up. They'd crush somebody with it. Most of the time, the Rock and Roll Express or Ricky Morton specifically, and they had a ton of heat. But I love that guy. And uh, he was just a tremendous – and, and, and uh, you know, Midnight would have been a great tag team without him, but with him as the manager and the mouthpiece, I mean, just all three of those guys together was, was, was total money. Did Jim Cornette, here's my question, have any influence on you with your promo cutting that you would go through later? Different style, but did he influence you in any way? <laughs> sure, I stole a lot of stuff from Cornette. <laughs> You kidding me? Corny and I were friends, and we we would travel from from time to time. We talked on the phone all the time. So yeah, I stole a ton of shit from Jim Cornette. You know, goddamn Houston, Texas can't even grow their own basketball players. They got imported from Nigeria. Houston, Texas English is a foreign goddamn language. I man, I stole all kinds of shit from him. Why he never did he come up with all that shit. People ask me, how'd you come up with all the stuff you, you were talking? And and he, Jim was talking a blue streak. I was just talking South Texas, you know, trash that you hang, you hear, you know, growing up in a deer camp. <laughs> yeah. Where did he come up with half that shit he come up with? Because I'm sitting there scratching my head. I said, first of all, I want him to shut up. Second of all, I don't know how he can just keep talking without repeating himself and never miss a beat. Yeah, it was, I guess, that damn Kentucky, Tennessee, growing up, listening to Jerry Lawler for all those years. I laughed my ass off one time. The Midnight Express were working in Houston against Master G and Brickhouse Brown. And this was during the how do we replace the junkyard dog experiment was going on. And Brickhouse and Master G were two of those uh, that didn't exactly work out that well. So what do you do? You make a tag team out of them. And Cornette cuts a promo on coming in and says, well, goddamn, <laughs> Master G, Brickhouse Brown, y'all coming to Houston, Texas this Friday night? Well, I got news for you, son. 
There's a job to be done in Houston, Texas. And I've never seen two guys that are more deserving of doing that job in Houston, Texas than Brickhouse Brown and Master G. And I got news for you, boys. Another news flash. You're both doing jobs in Houston, Texas. <laughs> now, to those that weren't on the inside, there it, it worked. Right. For those that are on the inside, it was like, oh my God, corny. But it was his classic delivery of what he did, how he said it, and the the pear shape. I remember Vince McMahon grabbing him one time, trying to to push him off the edge of something. And Vince grabbed him and immediately, like, revolted back, like, oh, God damn. I'm like, what? He goes, it's, there's just, it's just a flab. And I, I touched him and I, and I started sinking into it. Oh, my, what the, God damn, Jim, do you, have you ever done anything athletic? <laughs> no. But the, the repulsiveness in which Vince drew away from him, you know, I was like, oh, oh, God, oh my God, I've got to go bathe now, was absolutely hilarious and just, um, but that works. All right, before we continue on here with my conversation with Bruce Pritchard, let me tell you what my buddy Diamond Dallas Page is offering you because this is a deal you don't want to pass up. Dallas is giving you the best deal ever on his DDPY program. He wants y'all to live the healthiest life you can, and that's why he's giving you 25% off the DDPY DVDs, the DDP Yoga Now app, and all the DDPY swag he's got. I'm talking 25% off hats, T-shirts, heart rate monitors, and so much more. And because he's so committed to helping you all get on the path to healthier living, if you buy a max pack for 25%, you get the second one for 50% off. And that's an additional 50% off the 25% you're already getting. I ain't got to tell you what a huge savings that is. Just go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin and take advantage of this sale. And, of course, if you buy the DVDs, you'll also get three months free of the DDP Yoga Now app. And the app has a whole new set of DDP Yoga workouts. You can track your progress and your measurements. And you can do live workouts from the DDP Yoga Performance Center. So take control of your own health and fitness in a new year. Get on the DDPY program today and take advantage of this huge sale. 25% off the DDPY program and all DDPY-related merch at ddpyoga.com slash Austin. That is ddpyoga.com slash Austin. Hey, man, what are you waiting for? Get your health and get your fitness on track with DDPY. Go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. Steve Austin, Unleashed. Unleashed. Hey, I got a question for you, uh, something to wrestle with. As long as you've been in uh, WWE or in wrestling business in general, but let's, let's, let's talk about your time in WWE because you were a strong part of the creative force. There was many times you were helping me come up with shit or you, per, you were presenting me with ideas, how you got designated that task. Well, let me ask you, how did you get designated with the task of working with Stone Cold? Nobody else wanted to work with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. No, dude, I'm straight up. Um, was I considered a prick? You know what? The The real reason was, I think, well, you and I kind of had a rapport. Right. We got along with each other. I never bullshitted you. You would ask me, hey, what do you think about this? And I'd tell you straight up if I thought it sucked. And usually I would get that, uh, yeah, me too. And we would sit down and work through it. But – there was uh, an intimidation factor there. You're Stone Cold Steve Austin. You're the top guy. And, and when you would bark, people would think, oh, my God, Steve's yelling at me. I was like, Steve ain't yelling at you. He's just telling you that he doesn't like it. Change it. But for some of those guys, it was, well, I don't want to work with Steve because he's going to yell at me or he doesn't like my shit. Guess what? He doesn't like Vince's shit. He doesn't like my shit. He doesn't like his shit sometimes. <laughs> But it's his way of expressing himself. I never had a problem with it. But you I was always I, open-minded to hearing anything. But, you know, yeah. once you get to a certain level and, and you can be picky, you know, and, and I was wanting to accept anything that was viable. So it wasn't like – it's funny because when I look back and, like, when I talked to Dutch Mantell about my days in USWA, I came in there, you know, former football player right out of North Texas State – Greener and grass thought I was better than I was. wasn't trying to be a prick, but you know I was a little bit cocky because I was a pretty good athlete. But 
Well, all of a sudden, I get in the wrestling business, and I don't know fuck all. But, you know, and he had to, he had to smarten me up. And it, I wasn't trying to be a dick, and I, w- I was never arrogant. But my, I guess people, uh, you know, perception, and he had to be, he was the booker, he was the boss, so he had to lay the 411 down to me and tell me how it was, and he did, and I followed it. And, you know, when I was working with Bill Dundee, who's 5'7 and should be in the Hall of Fame, you know, I'm thinking, okay, shit, man, I'm 6'2", you know, 255. I'm probably going to beat the fuck out of this guy, right? right. No, not so fast. My friend, you're working That's with right. the superstar, Take and the soup. superstar is smart enough to keep himself over. He's gonna make you sell. You're gonna pay your dues. You're gonna learn from him. So, right. but yeah, you just uh, sometimes different people. It's like Undertaker. Undertaker can be quite menacing, quite scary if you don't know him and you're presenting him an idea. You know him like the back of your hand. You're very good friends. But he he can present that same ominous type, you know. And you know Taker, he's kind of like Clint Eastwood at six eleven, right. and he just hears something and he just kind of quiet, and he soaks it in. Whereas I would kind of be like a knee jerk reaction. Well, goddamn, any worth the fuck. But I. I was always willing to listen to a fucking point. But also, we communicated, too. We absolutely did. Well, we were and, friends. We and, didn't and hang we around. Friends. We didn't call each no. other. We didn't send text messages. We got along, and we were friends. And, yeah, and, and, and we, I trusted you. And we got and we got business done. And I, I always would like to try to say, I, I told the story. We covered in the Angle stuff. Remember when we were doing, you were hurt, Angle was hurt, but both on TV, and we were doing all that backstage shit. Well, we would write basically an outline of what we wanted to do and you would get there and uh, the, the fucking cowboy hats, man coming in with the cowboy hats, goddamn walking through the, through the airports, all these hats ought to be great. Hey, Kurt, I got you one. We didn't have that written in. We just did it that day. And I dare say we would fiddle fuck around all day so that we could get to live. Oh shit. We didn't get this done. I guess we're going to have to go live and we could pretty much get whatever the hell we wanted on air. I loved working with you because if it was the shits, I'd say, well, no, that's what Steve wanted to do. Oh, well, goddamn, in that case, it's awesome. <laughs> ah, God, I love it. <laughs> ah, that's Steve. That's great. Um, so <laughs> I enjoyed that aspect of it. And we could get, we were trusted to go live. And, and Vince entrusted us to our judgment that we weren't going to screw anything up. And we had a lot of fun. But the creativeness to, to come in, I didn't come in with, God damn, Steve, this is what you got to do. Right. I came in with, here's what we'd like to do. And then we would talk about it. How are we going to tell this story? How are we going to get this stuff done? And because I, I never I don't think I ever was one to dictate this how you're going to do it no because a lot of times I'd ask you and god damn what do you think well fuck I'll do it like this and you'd have a pretty good take on like fuck I like that so a lot of times we'd do it your way just based on the territories that you had been in it sounded like a good idea at the time it, it had worked now we never copied anybody but you had ideas from the places that you had been before so sometimes that cookie cutter shit came out and you put your salt and pepper on it and all of a sudden and the chicken shit became chicken salad. Yeah, and it was and it was fun and it was easy, but I I just think that I would always kind of chuckle at the intimidation factor. People were scared of you. You were the top guy. And unless I grew up in Texas, man, all my buddies are you basically, okay? Right. You know, we we speak the same language. You're not intimidating to me, you're just Steve. Right. And you're the top guy and made us all the shitload of money. But at the same time, guess what? You know, we can have a damn conversation over what's good. And as Vince used to say, got a pretty good track record, pal. So let's go with it. If it works, they, they think that a lot of times that it's all one way. Right. And that doesn't work. It's got to be two ways. You got to listen to the guy that's got to perform it. The guy that creates it and is performing it. They got to believe it. And you, you're not a character. You're just Steve Austin. And you turn that volume up there, and that's all it is. And people don't understand that. They think, well, if, you know, if they'd given me that Stone Cold character, 
Who oh, gave yeah. you the Stone Cold character? Ain't nobody gave me that shit. I came up with the name and Thank finally you. dialed it up. Had a few conversations with Vince when he you know, was editing my shit out. And, you know, it, it, things turned into what they turned into. I want to shift gears, something else for you to wrestle with. I'm talking to Bruce Pritchard, host of some of the Wrestle With podcasts. It's lighting up iTunes. Uh, where all can people find this podcast, Bruce? MLW well, Network? Uh, what is it? M- MLW Radio Network. And, of course, on iTunes, Audio Boom. We're, we're every place that you can find podcasts pretty much you can find us and it's something to wrestle with bruce pritchard and um we're there for you man and we're we're setting the world on fire right now i'm i'm humble brag hashtag hey, humble go for brag. It, man god damn if, if nobody's gonna put your shit over but yourself you, you, know, you, <laughs> you, you came to the job for yourself you got to go over here's what something for I? you to wrestle with let's talk about as long as you were in wwe uh people uh getting over You've seen some people come over in there like, yeah, well, I'll go ahead and say it, you know, like Lex Luger. He came in over that Lex Express, and goddamn, you know, he was going to be the next guy, and it just didn't work out so much. So I don't want to, I don't want to uh, harp or focus on Lex Luger, but I always like to ask people who have been around, who've seen, you know, Jesus Christ as, as a as a person who grew up as a fan of the business, a student of the game, and inside the the closest workings with Vince McMahon. Uh, quick story. I've told it a million times. I'll tell you. We were at the garden. You know, the entrance to the garden is very short way to the ring. Right. There's the blue curtains at the dressing room. I was there when uh, the click broke kayfabe at the big hug fest when uh, Kevin and Razor went down south. But I was there, and Steve Blackman walked to the ring, and me and Vince were watching at the curtain, and the crowd gave him a pretty good fucking response. And me and Vince looked at each other and said, God damn, it's a pretty good pop. And Vince looked at me and he goes, yeah, you know, Steve, I really hope you can get over. And when he said that, Bruce, it was like a light light bulb went off in my head. It's like, okay, I get it. This man can set the table for you. He can want you to get over. He can put a rocket pack on you. But at the end of the day, it's up for you to get over. So to you and everything that you've seen uh, from – massive successes to people who had boatloads of potential but never could get it to the catastrophic failures in your opinion what does it take for someone to get over it you know it's that intangible it and it's different for everybody but it's 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 a combination of charisma but they also got to believe in themselves everybody I'm not picking on Mark Merrow, but I'll use Mark Merrow for an example. As Johnny B. Bad, I'll never forget Vince saying to me, I can see him as champion. Maybe he could have seen Johnny B. Bad as champion. Unfortunately, outside of that character, it wasn't there. And then I I take examples. I always use you. I use Rock, Mick Foley, Triple H is the guys. Steve, you were the ringmaster. All right. God damn that damn Texas accent. Nobody wants to hear that. (laughs) That Southern drawl bullshit. And Paul Heyman calling me before we did the first thing saying, put a microphone in his hands. And I remember telling you, you asked me, hey, I got something I want to say. And I remember saying, well, not supposed to let you talk. However, we're live. So whatever happens, happens. And you talked. And you did the whole, you know, put your hand on the camera and all that on the TV yep. and feel the guys that had the balls to step out and try something. Guys talk about the brass ring and all oh, it's all bullshit. It's all manufactured. No, the guys that step out of what they are told. And it's a double edged sword because if yeah. you step out and you fail, you get your ass chewed and you're chastised. But if you step out and you succeed, then all of a sudden you're a genius, and they and they they'll get behind it. People are afraid of failure. The guys that make it are the ones that are willing to step out and continually step out. Rock would would go by the script, and Hunter would eat him up alive because Hunter would go off script, and Rock would come back and throw the script in my face and go, "This guy's out here doing this shit. I'm trying to do my job. I'm doing what I'm told." And I said to him the same thing. I said, hey, man, it's live. 
if you can take the ass chewing when you come back, and if it sucks, you're going to get your ass chewed. But if it's good, what are they going to do? And he took the chance, and he went out there and went off script when Hunter went off script. And all of a sudden, magic. Yeah. Big, <laughs> big know? shift because Rock was quick on his feet and a, a, a very dynamic promo and a very dynamic entertainer and always quick with a comeback when he's able to come back with a comeback. And and how many times do, do you see guys that just sit back and wait for creative brink? What, what do you have for me? Instead of saying, I have ten things for you, maybe none of them work, but at least they – came with 10 different suggestions to do something. And if somebody's thinking about their character and they're constantly thinking about what else can I do to get better, some of it may suck, but that one thing might hit. And as long as you're continually reinventing yourself, Undertaker, how many times has he reinvented himself? Oh, shit. 10 or 15, 20. Yeah. (laughs) Whatever it's taken, but it's all worked. And he's still relevant today. Man, one of the guys that comes to my mind, because uh, he's uh, a good friend of mine's favorite wrestler, Zach Wilde, Black Label Society. Goddamn, he's the biggest Ultimate Warrior fan in the world. And so, you know, when I'm thinking of my favorite workers, I'm thinking of, you know, uh, workers, technicians, rock and roll, midnight, flair, dusty uh, characters, but also really great workers. And, of course, I was a huge fan of the Ultimate Warrior as well, but for different reasons uh, of what he did to the uh, – it wasn't that he ran to the ring, uh, Gorilla Press, run around hitting the ropes, you know, uh, the, 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 to- the totality of what he was as an attraction I was a fan of. But I was watching this interview that he did on YouTube, and it was about a 20 to 30 minute interview, and it was just him talking very calmly. And he was talking about when, you know, he was sometimes when he was cutting some of those way out there promos, he was inside his head. He was going so far in the character. You know, on, on one hand, he was thinking, God, man, I'm really out there on this. But he really believed that shit and he went so far out on the limb. A lot of people shit on his promos, but they worked for his character. And the fact that he believed it so much, it was a fucking shoot. So whether you're talking about loading up spaceships, whatever, you know, uh, he believed it. And so if, 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 you're, if you're not convicted, hey, I can go up there and talk about, hey, stomping the mud hole, walking a drive. But if I say it trepidatiously and I don't fucking believe I can, and I'm just saying it because I think it sounds cool, eh, yeah, ain't going to mean a fiddler's fuck. But I appreciated the fact that I could see, you know, that there was a, there was a separation. This was a conscious effort on the on the part of him to go so fucking far out that you know he was willing to go out on a limb and take a crash landing. And the guy was a hell of a draw, and he, and he drew big money. He he didn't have the longest lasting top run in the history of the business, but he went the fuck out there and was not afraid. I appreciate that about the guy. And you can say the same thing about Randy Savage too. He was he was different, but he believed it. And guys like the Warrior, they were different, and that was what made them that draw. People looked at everybody else, and these guys made themselves unique. They made themselves different than the rest of the pack. Let me go ahead. Let me let me jump in and ask you about. Here's a guy, uh, and you probably know him pretty well. Did you? How well did you know Brad Armstrong? I knew Brad pretty well, yeah. He was oh. best friends with my brother. Tom knows him, knew him a lot better than I did, but I knew Brad pretty well. Okay, if you knew Brad or you had a conversation with him, off the cuff, one of the funniest cats in the dressing room. Right. Could pop anybody, could light anybody up. And as far as being a technician in the ring, he could work uh, Lucha style, American style. If he was in Japan, Japan style, whatever the style was, he could do it. But in the big stage, you know, in trying to get over – he was just, you know, he. I don't want to say he was just because I was a big fan of his, and I don't want to disrespect him. He's no longer with us, but he 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 never got over at the level I thought should go with the, the kind of work that he could do. Because, and I I think I agree with everything you said. The difference with Brad Armstrong was I think Brad approached the business as a work. In his entire life, his dad one of the greatest workers ever. And his dad told stories in his promos. His yeah. dad could 
You talk his ass off. Bullet Bob, you talk about some classic promos, go look up some Bullet Bob Armstrong <laughs> promos. Off the chart. I kind of got the feeling that Brad looked at the business as a work, and his promos were a work versus just being Brad and being who he really was. Because he was a sharp-witted, sharp-tongued son of a bitch that could cut anybody down, could talk with the best of them. But when the red light went on, he became who he thought that Brad Armstrong was in the wrestling world. You know, another guy that reminds me uh, uh, like that was primetime Brian Lee down there in the USWA. That's Correct. Right. Riding down the road because he he was, dude, me, him, and Dr. Tom, your brother, riding down the road in the USWA. And then that was the one time when, when Tom dropped that Come to Jesus meeting on us. And well, shit, we was going to Memphis. He goes, Steve, let me ask you a question. What's so stunning about stunning Steve? And he said the same thing. Brian, what's so prime time about Brian Lee? I've, I've, I've told the story before, so I don't want to beat him to the ground. But, you know, he was the one that got me thinking, okay, well, well. <laughs> What is my gimmick? What is my character? I really don't have one. I'm just some cocky, arrogant guy. Dutch Mantel gave me the name. I wasn't. I wasn't at the the point in time where I would develop that until I would go to ECW, and then go to WWF. But I guess going back, the uh, original question would have been, uh, Primetime Brian Lee was a dynamic personality. But when the red light went on, he wasn't the guy that was popping everybody in the dressing room. I he always, tried to be someone else. Right. When all and he needed to be was himself. Exactly. And to get we, – we tried Brad Armstrong out on color commentary because listening to him in the back, doing commentary on guys' oh, matches yeah, while yeah. he's not – and, I mean, it was a sellout at the monitor to listen to him bust on people and to do commentary. Put that microphone in front of him in the red light. Well, I'm going to tell you something, Mr. Ross. Yeah. <laughs> it became yeah. vanilla. And it just didn't work. And there were there were a lot of guys like that that you just wished you could get their personality in real life on TV. Capture, capture that moment on tape. So, but back to the the original thing that I got off on uh, ten fifteen minutes ago. Just getting over for you, it's it factor. It's the it factor. And whether it's, it's whether whether it's the work, whether it's the personality, whether it's the gimmick, and I dare say not everything as far as the gimmick has to be authentic, but it just has to be something that people can relate to or buy into, or that you can present to them at at, at a level that they can believe. Flair, from a standpoint of work character gimmick uh, flair was a shoot uh, right probably the greatest to ever lace up a pair of boots in my opinion as far as making the rounds and defending the world title you know and and all over the world he seemingly had everything but to me what, what, what whatever it is it's work or there's gimmick or whatever it's being able to, to for people to buy into what or who you are whether it's from a hate level or a love level but they've got to be able to buy in and and for people to truly feel it one of one of my biggest pet peeves were i use the example you remember Ockham albrecht the big german Brockus? yes okay. bodybuilder bodybuilder big guy big german had a great look nice guy super nice guy didn't have a clue didn't want to necessarily be in the business it was a paycheck for him it was a, a means to an end he's in the ring with jeff jarrett and he's got a headlock on Jeff, and Jeff tells him, "All right, big boy, calm down. Just listen to the, just listen to the audience. Just listen, calm down, listen." He lets go of the headlock and says, "What? What are they saying? What? <laughs> Who? What am I? Li- what?" <laughs> it's a feeling, and I, I would always try to tell young guys, man, it's not about what to what the audience is saying or doing. It's it's the feeling. What are you feeling when you're out there? And you got to feel that audience. And they'll they'll take you along. They'll they'll tell you where you need to go, but you need to direct them, and you need to take the audience where you want them to go. But it's all about feeling. It's not necessarily about just doing. It's about getting out there in, in the audience. At WrestleMania in Toronto with Hulk and Rock, I was in the audience with Brian Gewertz. Watch the whole match. 
We had built this thing up, the NWO, Hulk Hogan, bad guy, horrible, worst guy in the world, The Rock, my God, most electrifying man in the business. And we're standing out there, and that audience wasn't having it. They wanted the Hulk Hogan that they had grown up with. They wanted red and yellow. They loved him. They were happy he was back, yep. and they were going to cheer him no matter how much we told them not to. And he is standing there going, goes, my God, he's in there with The Rock. Why are they booing The Rock? Right. Because he ain't fucking Hulk Hogan. And they want Hulk right now. Right. They've had Rock. Hulk's new again. And he and it was just that relationship that he had with the audience. And just to elaborate on that match, they both recognized, knew their roles, as The Rock would say, and yep. worked Hogan babyface, Rock Hill. And that was one of the, if not the most crowd-engaged matches that I've <laughs> ever seen in my life because, Jesus Christ, that was a big building. And everybody was on the edge of their seat or standing up. And it was just, it was a basic match, but it was a great match. And a great match is defined by how that crowd is responding to it. And they bought every goddamn thing they did, hook, line, and sinker. They were in. They were so emotionally invested in those two characters, those two personas, those two human beings. It was an amazing match, not from a scientific or technical standpoint, <laughs> from from the fact story, that show feeling. business and story and feeling. It was and awesome. that's the beauty. That's and those the beauty guys, of the business. And, of course, Hogan, the savvy veteran, and, you know, Rock was his junior, but, you know, a veteran at the time, they went with it and, and just totally rocked it. It was, it, was, it, was one of, it was one of the coolest matches I've ever seen. And that's the difference. I, I think that a lot of younger guys put in that same position would panic and go, oh, my God. Oh, no, no, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. And, and it's like, just open your ears, open your heart, let them in. And, okay, if you can't get them to go with you, go with them and, and take that ride. But a lot of it, so, uh, someone else might have been out there and go, oh, it's backfiring. It's backfiring. You know, right. What do we do? No, they just right. proceeded accordingly and rocked the house. Okay, what if I told you that you don't have to give up snacking as part of your new Get Healthier plan this year? I ain't kidding. You don't got to give it up entirely. You just have to snack smarter. And that's where Nature Box comes in. Nature Box makes snacks that actually taste great and they're better for you. They're made with high quality ingredients that don't have any artificial colors, flavors, or sweeteners. And they got something for everyone. They got snacks like Naked Trail Mix, Salt and Vinegar Veggie Chips, and Honey Barbecue Crunch, and Nature Box recently improved their service. Now you can order as much as you want, as often as you want, with no minimum purchase required, and you can cancel any time. So go to naturebox.com slash Austin and check out their snack catalog. There are over 100 snacks to choose from, and they're always adding new snacks, too. Just choose the ones you like, and they'll deliver them right to your door. And if you ever try a snack that you don't like, Nature Box will replace it for free. And right now, you'll save even more. Nature Box is offering 50% off your first order when you go to naturebox.com slash Austin. That's naturebox.com slash Austin for 50% off your first order. Naturebox.com slash Austin. Y'all know how much I appreciate you listening to Unleashed every single week. And that's why we've created a new automated email system to make sure you never miss a single episode. Just go to podcastone.com slash Steve Austin and sign up. We'll let you know exactly when a new show is out and who the guest is. So sign up now at podcastone.com slash Steve Austin. That's podcastone.com slash Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleashed. Unleashed. Let, let's uh, hear something for you to wrestle with. I keep going back to the theme of Bruce Pritchard's podcast. It's good to talk to him. I'm sitting here watching him on Skype. That's why this conversation is so good. <laughs> I can see this guy when he's telling these stories about Vince grabbing Jim Cornette. I'm watching the visuals. So I'm popping. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's go to a match that just happened at uh, the Royal Rumble: John Cena versus AJ Styles. The business has taken many steps forward, Bruce, from what you and I grew up on. 
Back in the day, you know, grab a headlock, kid. You know, you could lay in a headlock 5, 10, sometimes 15 minutes. I mean, it was a whole different setup. You know, tackle, drop down, hip toss, get it again was a pretty big deal. And so sometimes, you know, the way the business has sped up so much, I'm like, God damn, are they going to sell anything anymore? These guys went out there, and, and I appreciate the, the, where the business is right now, especially with the pacing that happened at the Royal Rumble. The guys are more athletic. The business has evolved, just like all of all of professional sports has evolved. Baseball right. is faster. Football is faster. Our business is faster. But, man, Cena and AJ went out there and had about a 24-minute match, and it was just a bust-ass performance from both guys. And what I appreciated about that and really the, the whole pay-per-view was the pacing of the match completely satisfied you know everything that i needed to happen just to to believe and buy in because they sold everything to uh the degree that needed to be to, to be sold uh what were your thoughts about that match i loved it and the first thought that went through my head was how many people criticized john cena talking about ah oh, cena's works horrible bullshit john works his ass off and john is a good maybe great worker it takes two to tango, and AJ Styles couldn't be happier, more proud of somebody. Because I worked with AJ at TNA, and I remember telling AJ in Birmingham, Alabama, and we were talking about his contract going forward. And AJ cut this impassioned promo on me about how he was the best one there and how he deserved to be the champion. And by God, I will outwork and I will beat anybody that you could ever bring into this company. And not one of them, not one of them is going to be able to lace my boots. And I said, you cut that promo and you're the man. Because he was always worried about being a character. And that's what he's cutting now. He's You're seeing Alan Jones out there. You're seeing AJ Styles, the guy that knows that he's the best, the guy that knows he can deliver every night, and the guy that goes out there and does it and believes it. And he loves the business. He wants to be in the business because he wants to be a wrestler. He wants to be the star. He wants to be the guy. And he's willing to put in the work. He's willing to bust his ass. And the son of a bitch is good. And you couple that with Cena, the same exact thing. John's the highest paid guy in the business right now. He's the highest paid guy in the business right now because he's the hardest working. But he's not doing it for the money. Probably is. But at the same time, he's doing it because it's what he always wanted to do. He loves the business. That's the difference. And that's why that match was so damn good. I I was all I don't want to say I was in awe, but I was yeah, I guess I was pretty much in awe watching that match going, shit, they're tearing it up. I said the same thing uh, when I broke down this uh, that pay per view with Wade Keller. I said that's one of the damnedest matches I've ever seen, and I knew AJ Styles was a hellacious worker when he came into the WWE. And I just kept thinking, man, I said they beat him what three, four, five times when he first came in. I can't remember, but uh, I kept thinking, God damn, this, this kid is legit one of the best workers in the world. He could be a major superstar here. He's not your your prototype big guy. But when he's got that swagger like he's got going now, uh, his workability right now, that persona, like that hunger to be the best, I, I just smelled money with the kid. I smelled great matches with the kid. So hats off to his success. You can say nothing about his work. He can work circles around 99% of the people in the business, if not more than that. Uh, as far as Cena goes, I said, you know, uh, on my podcast, how much I thought of the run that Cena's had. I mean, when you when you look at that, the run that, that Cena's had, Bruce, it's one of the best in the history of the business. And when you look at the body of work, I said it. He's had more high-profile, big big money, big pressure matches than I have. He's been around a lot longer, but he, you know, and he's delivered in about ninety-nine percent of those matches. And then someone will say, "Oh, his punches are the shits." Or this or that, and they'll point to one particular thing, and I'm thinking, God damn, you know, everybody's got their right to their opinion, but if you can't see what Cena's doing and recognize the fact that he's had outstanding matches with I don't shit I don't know how many different heels, 
uh, a shitload. Uh, maybe his punch isn't the greatest punch, but if you're going to break down minutia like that, then you can be a fan of the business, and the business is subjective, right. but you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. The guy can flat out work. He's not the smoothest guy in the ring. He's not Brad Armstrong. He ain't got to be. He's John Cena. He's built like a brick shit house. He's strong as an ox. That finishing sequence, the dude is, is one of the hardest working guys in the business. He's always got a smile on his face. And Bruce, as long as you've been around the business, this isn't a kiss John Cena's ass hour. But you know what it takes. You saw me when I was on top. Uh, you've seen The Rock on top. You've seen shit, all the, the some of the biggest stars on top. Hey, man, it's a pressure cooker. And you get a lot of shit on you, and you, you've got to you got to protect yourself, which Cena does. He does it in a very political fashion. He, he he's a he's a super smart, savvy guy. He's been around long enough. He should be if he's you know he wouldn't have the right. run in his head. But you can't break down one or two things that he doesn't do the best mechanically and say that he can't work his ass off. Cena can flat out work. Bottom line. Without a doubt. And he can work in every single aspect. And people talk about, oh, well, listen to the reaction. They're booing him. They mm. care about him. Yes. You know what? I don't care if they're booing him or cheering him. They care about him. And for somebody to get that kind of reaction, positive, negative, a lot of guys get out there and it's golf clap or nothing at all. It's just dead silence. He elicits reaction. He elicits emotion from people one way or another. Yeah. But you can never take away how hard he works. And, and that's – if I ever get pissed off about anything, I get pissed off when they talk about Cena being the shits or they or they talk about – and, okay, another kiss-ass thing I get accused of all the time – is Triple H, who – if Triple H wasn't married to Stephanie McMahon, I would say he would probably still be in the same position he's in now. I agree. The guy loved the business. The guy worked his ass off. You know, you were you were there. He yeah. was he always had ideas for other people. He was always wanting to learn. And I mean, there there's folks. I ain't going back there. I got no reason to kiss anybody's ass. But that son of a bitch works hard and has the same same type of work ethic. And he gets knocked constantly because he happens to be married to the boss's daughter. If he wasn't, he'd probably still be in the same position. I think he still would be too. Moving on from uh, AJ and Cena, Royal Rumble. A lot of people didn't like it. You've been a part of a whole bunch of them. How many would you say? I wrote the first one by myself. Now, Pat Patterson put the Royal Rumble match together. And funny story about the first ever Royal Rumble in Toronto. We forgot to get Martell out. <laughs> <laughs> Who won? Uh, Duggan. So, Jim Duggan won. So, so what happened when all so, of a sudden you're live and Martell doesn't have it out? Well, we're, we're watching this on the USA Network, and I was doing the gorilla position with Dick Ebersol, and that's where the, the term Titan Time was invented because other shit had gone long, and we're looking and going, okay, every two minutes. If we do every two minutes, we're going to be off the air. So we started, some guys would be 90 seconds, some guys would be 60 seconds. It just, whenever it was time to go, hit the buzzer, man. Here they go. And that was that was Eversol that says, just, just fudge it, man. Do whatever. So we're watching, and, and I had a list of guys going in and going out. And I said, Pat. And he, he's looking at us. When's, what's the next thing? And he's like, what the hell is Martell still doing in there? <laughs> <laughs> and we're looking at the sheet and go, he's he's not on here anywhere. Pat. Well, the time, he knows he's not winning the damn thing. <laughs> what the hell is he still doing in there? And whoever went out uh, next, we told him, get Martell out of the damn rumble. <laughs> we forgot. But I, I did a lot of them. And that was... It, it turned into a several-day process in later years. But that was something that I had more fun doing was the Royal Rumble match itself. For many years, it was just me and Pat, and then we would bring other people into the process, and it would be so much fun just to 
have that whole match evolve. And every once in a while I would do the, let's actually do a drawing. Let's, let's just pull names and see what happens. Ah, that's the shit. So Bruce, yeah, <laughs> fuck that. It's a work. You tell a story. You had a beta case. Chase. So <laughs> we, we would just look at, and we would tell our stories and space them out. I liked the rumble. I did too. I, I thought it was a damn good rumble. It had stories all throughout it. To me, it worked. Well, for, for, for me, it worked, too, but I heard a lot of people pissing and moaning that the big names weren't in there long enough, and I'm sitting there thinking, hey, man, when you bring your big guns out there, they've got to do something so impactful. There can only be, well, like Braun Strowman. He was out there, and, and he's not a super over guy like a Brock, uh, a Les Bur- like a Brock uh, Goldberg, Taker. Uh, those guys were special guys towards the end. I loved uh, Reigns at the 30 spot. Braun came out there. This guy's a work in progress. Looked like a superstar the entire night from interfering with the Roman Reigns KO match to doing the damage there, not overstaying his welcome, not gloating like a jabroni, getting the fuck back, going into the Royal Rumble. He looked very polished, looked very calm. Confident, and then he gets taken out by Corbin, and then you get the big guys in there. Uh, that everything made sense for me, so I enjoyed the shit out of it. Go they ahead. all had spotlights. Yes, the, the the guys, the big stars, they had spotlights. You remember them coming in and going out. It wasn't you didn't mesh them all together into where every look everybody can't win. You can't have everybody in the main event. They can't have everybody be the champion and nobody doing jobs. And that spotlight is only so big. So I thought everybody was spotlighted perfectly. I enjoyed the hell out of the match. I, th- I thought it was good. What were your marching orders uh, on the ones that you, you, you wrote the first one? But like would Vince t- t- specifically say, hey, we need this guy, this guy, this guy to really do some damage or, you know, you're going to Vince is going to pick the winner or, or whatever because of booking. But what were your marching orders just as far as writing and organizing order of elimination? It's funny. At first, Vince didn't care. Because it was a, the the very first one was just a special for USA. And then the other one, it was an attraction. The the champion wasn't in it. It wasn't, you know, we had, it wasn't that big of a deal. Who are we going to get over? That's what he cared about. Get the stories over to get to WrestleMania. That's what he cared about. We did everything else. As it progressed, WrestleMania 9 was the first year that we had the winner meet the champion at WrestleMania. So now the Rumble had a different importance, and there was more of an emphasis. The year before that, they had had the one where they crowned the champion in flair. But this time it was like, okay, the winner gets a title shot. So it was important. You won something. You just weren't the Royal Rumble champion. And once we did that, it it had a different significance, and we uh, would pick a guy. Kane we did one year, and you, you pick that guy, Roman Reigns they've done. They did it with Strowman this year. That gets that spotlight. He's going to get that extra shine. Diesel. Yep. We, we did it with Diesel when Diesel was the bodyguard of Shawn Michaels and wanted to see he was starting to get reaction in the house shows. I was like, well, let's see how this son of a bitch can do on his own. And we spotlighted him getting rid of people and went, uh-oh, we got a star on our hands here. And you can you can pretty much tell that in, in those situations when you put those guys out there. In your years of doing the uh, Royal Rumble or watching uh, when you weren't involved, but w- were there any cases of guys going out there who weren't picked to, to shine in the match but were able to do something that resonated with the old man and said, God damn, maybe we need to do something with this guy? Shawn Michaels was probably the first one early on. When Sean lasted, and, and this was before Sean was in the mix of being a uh, champion, but just Sean's performance. I think he was in there for 45 minutes or something like that. But he was doing spots with everybody. Right. And that's where Vince went, God damn, that little, is there anybody that little bastard can't work with? <laughs> and he stood out. Uh, Jericho this year, it, it was funny. You know, Jericho did the the little under the rope and stayed on the outside. But Jericho kind of did that this year, and he, he made his stuff count. I, I look at the spots that they had that were meant to, to be those big spots, and I thought they delivered on all of them. Goldberg and Brock loved it. They're building that match all over again that 
it's funny. The people that shit all over the first time Goldberg came in and, oh, we dropped the ball, we did this. Fuck that. It didn't work. <laughs> it just didn't work. This time, they're shitting all over. Well, he shouldn't beat Brock so quickly. God damn, man. But you're talking about it. You're interested right. in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way Brock sold it was classic heel. He is so good. Um, I love that. I, I love the bumps that he always takes over the top rope. He kind of goes forward over, and it's kind of like, God damn, he's going to kill himself, but he's graceful as a gazelle in this controlled bump. But he's so athletic. He's about the only guy on the card that, that can try a bump like that. But he's done it on several occasions. He, t- he, he takes a clothesline, but he just kind of somersaults or, or tumbles over that top rope, and it's the damnedest thing. And, of course, you know, he's, he's a physical freak, but it's a great bump. The look on his face, you know, Brock, you know, there, there's the setup. But I thought, you know, a lot of people shit on Roman Reigns in the 30 spot. I popped because I'm thinking, dude, okay, here's a setup, guys. Something's up. And then Jericho gets out, so there's the three. And so you got uh-huh. two heels, a baby. You know, it's going to be a double team. Goddamn, Roman Reigns is going to somehow defeat two heels again, and he's going to win a fucking rumble. Set up. I smelled a rat from the beginning, and I just couldn't believe what I was going to end up seeing. He goes to uh, charge Randy Orton for the spear, and, of course, Randy Orton connects with an RKO. Boom, over the top rope. Randy wins. I, th- I thought Roman Reigns in the 30 spot was tr- tremendous uh, idea and great booking. I loved it because everybody – there was that groan – of, oh, they're going to, oh, not him again. <laughs> and here's another, here's another guy, okay, in Roman Reigns. When he was coming up and everybody was like, I want something. I just want something new. I'm sick of Cena. I'm sick of Orton. I'm sick of all these guys. I just want something new. And Roman Reigns was coming up. He was, he was swelling underneath. And, they want why don't they do something with reigns why don't they give him a shot and daniel bryan was out with his injury but the mistake they made was bringing daniel bryan back and putting him in the damn rumble and not having him win the damn thing and then you put roman reigns over and then everybody turned on roman because daniel bryan didn't get it right you wanted something new you're begging for roman reigns we give him to you but he wasn't daniel bryan that wasn't Roman Reigns' fault. That was he's another one that, that works his butt off. I enjoy his stuff. I don't I'm not a big fan of his promos. I think uh, he's coming into his own though, just and I don't think he's where he needs to be right now. I, I just still maintain I man, he'd be he's just a good looking guy, great body, he's got presence. Uh, needs to work on the promos, but I think his words are coming a little bit more. I think he's starting finally to get a sense. And when I say finally, you know, let's, let's not get lost in the fact that the kid's only been in the business five years. Thank you. So do right. that. You know, it took me, you know, five years to kind of get it. And then seven and a half, I, I really started talking when Paul E. gave me the shot down there in ECW. So then, you know, seven and a half, when they started pushing me a stone cold, you know, then I was a well-rounded mechanic. You work healer, baby. Then I started putting the, the promo together. So, you know, it's like all, the, all of a sudden, you know, these when and the shield, those guys were all protected because, you know, whether it was Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, or Roman Reigns, uh, in their totality, all they had to do was 33 and a third percent of the work. And then the other guys could fill in. So, you know, now they're all having to do everything. And I I really think Roman has progressed, and he still needs to to improve. But I see a really good run as that kid with a heel first. I keep saying this, and this is just me. And once he has that heel run, I think he has the potential to have a monster baby run. But the, the, to, I still believe in him. But uh, I, I thought his performance in that match with KO was great. The way he sold for Strowman was great, and the yeah. way he did in the Roman as being as uh, what he did in the Rumble as a setup guy was great. So I, I, I'm a fan, you know, and and. and Sometimes, you know, early on, I picked on him because I had to pick on him because I had to call out the obvious. I can't sit here and lie. But, right. man, you know, as, as you and I sit here and look at each other on this Skype, 
I'm a fan of everybody that's in that business. I want everybody to get over, whether it's a healer baby, and I want everybody to make money, especially when I sit back and I'm not in it. I, and I'm looking for guys to make it. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to sit here on my on my couch and just be the armchair quarterback and say, ah, oh, he ain't worth a shit. He ain't doing this. He ain't. I'm, not the, I'm not the grizzled veteran. I'm a fan of the business. I'm a fan of the boys, so I want them all to get over and make money. And I think that gets lost on people. They want to just pick apart and critique. I personally like to sit back and enjoy. Now, there's some things I enjoy exactly. more, some things I enjoy less. And if I enjoy less and you ask me about it, I'll tell you the truth about it. And it's, it's kind of like that mechanic gimmick that we had for you. If you only would have done that, you know, with like a wrench in your back pocket, come out and go, hey, you need your car fixed? <laughs> <laughs> I popped when uh, somebody said that to me. You guys had a mechanic gimmick for Steve Austin. What did you want him to do, work on cars? God damn it, I don't know. Hey, uh, Bruce, let, let, let's wrap this thing up. Before before we wrap this thing up, let's ask, uh, I want to uh, ask a non-wrestling related question. Uh, I get all the time emails to questions at steveaustinshow.com. Hey, Steve, what's your podcast set up? Uh, How did you get started in the podcast business? And my agents came to me. Hey, Podcast One was interested in doing something with me. So I just started and started flying by the seat of my pants. When I'm at the house, I use a Zoom H4 and recorder, two Shure SM58 mics. And at home right now, I'm talking on a Blue Yeti mic, looking at Bruce Pritchard on Skype. So what's your setup there just as far as your your, your audio or your recording capabilities? How, How you got your setup over there? Well, I got my little Sony microphone here. Uh, Sounds great. Audio, no, Audio Technica uh, microphone. And I just have a real simple soundboard, and that's it. I hook it up into my computer, and I'm good to go. When I'm in Alabama at Conrad Thompson's house, he's got a nice little studio set up in his house, but it's just a soundboard, a couple decent. My microphone's only 100 bucks. That's the same with mine. Yeah, just simple setup. But and if you, you guys got a recording, computer, if you guys recording uh, a Conrad, you say you're running a board. I remember I went to Jay Moore's place one time, and he does his podcast out of his garage, and he has his buddy over there running a board. So I figured, hey, Jay Moore's got a board. I got to go get one. So I spent ninety nine bucks and got a board. And a board, we're talking about board. We're talking about mixing and recording levels. That's it. Jesus Christ, man! I sit there with my computer. I have I'm not running anything on this. It's just straight up Skype. And when I'm on my recorder, just doing my my reads or, or whatever, it's just through a recorder. And then I email that stuff through some kind of FTP file to Stacy over there in the nine zero two one zero. But I ain't got nothing extravagant. No, it's simple. I mean, we also have the your portable one. Yeah. That you take, Conrad's got one of those too, and. You have a couple microphones, and right into that, you download the file, you're good to go. It's simple. Hey, well, talk about the podcast one more time. Tell people where where they can uh, latch onto this thing, because I know it's been exploding. It's on fire. Everybody uh, I see on your Twitter account is raving about the show. They love what you guys are doing. It's something to wrestle with. Uh, Give a plug one more time so people can find this goddamn show. Well, something to wrestle with, Bruce Pritchard. We are on the MLW Radio Network. You can catch us on iTunes. Please subscribe to us. Leave us a review, a rating and a review. We greatly appreciate it. And you can also uh, check us out at BrucePritchard.com for all my great T-shirts. Uh, that'll take you on over to Pro Wrestling Tees, where you can get all my stuff along with Stone Cold Steve Austin shirts. <laughs> so I'm just I'm just stealing shit from everybody, <laughs> my God. But BrucePritchard.com for all my T-shirts and hats and all my gimmicks galore and mlw radio for the podcast or itunes it's something to wrestle with bruce pritchard and i I have to add i I, check this out see steve can see this on uh on skype my daughter's a wrestler she's an amateur wrestler in high school and she won the uh the Lone Star Armbar Most Outstanding Girl in first place in her division a couple weeks ago. And, I, of course, I keep the trophy in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so people come in and I go, yeah, that's, that's, that's my old wrestling. That's my old shooter trophy right over there. Oh, that's my little medal. But she's a little badass uh, well, in what, women's what grade wrestling. What is she at? She, she's so, a senior in high school. So what's she going to do after that? She wants to be a teacher, but I, I if she, trust me, if somebody comes and says, hey, we'll give you a scholarship, uh, her happy ass is going to be scholarship in some <laughs> Is she <laughs> have any designs on being in MMA? No, no, no. She doesn't like getting hit, but she doesn't mind hitting. 
She'll throw a cross face. She'll throw one of those Jerry Briscoe. Jerry Briscoe helps kind of like coach her and give her points of view. I send the videos of her matches to Briscoe at tournaments, and then he critiques them, and she sits there, and she studies them, she gets on the phone with him. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Now, now, now you need to shoot that forearm. Get, get that right across the nose and drive, just get that bone right on the bone and, and drive it in there. So, yeah. It's, you got salty-ass yeah. Jerry Briscoe giving <laughs> your daughter all these insider tips. Uh, yes. How old is she? She's going to be 18 next 18. month. That's awesome. And, my, and, her, and her twin brother, who's going to be, yeah, they're both, God damn, they're going to be 18. That's kind of scary. But he's he's a soccer man. He plays soccer and she wrestles, so go figure. All right, you old relic. I'm going to let you ride off into the sunset. It was great talking to you, Bruce. Congratulations on the success of the show. Thank you, Steve. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everybody. Give me the go home. Cue this time to wrap up his podcast, Ride Off in the Sunset. I want to thank Bruce Pritchard for being my guest today. It was good to talk to Bruce and get the word on the street about his podcast. Many of you already listened to it. It's called Something to Wrestle With. Him and his uh, partner, Conrad Thompson, laying down the bullshit, shooting the breeze, and uh, talking to anything and everything that you send in uh, for their topics of discussion. Uh, Bruce is a good friend, a guy who helped me out immensely uh, during my run in the WWF, and I always had a good time hanging out with him and working and shooting the shit. He's a funny guy and a smart guy, and he remembers half the bullshit or most of the bullshit that he went through. Congratulations on the success of your show. Good luck to you, Bruce. Hey, man. We give you guys a video to watch for right off into the sunset. And I got on YouTube, and I don't know how I found this damn match, but you got to check this out. It's called The Great Antonio versus Antonio Inoki. And in this match, there's this guy, The Great Antonio. Yeah, I guess he was a strong man back in the day. I think mentally he wasn't all there. Uh, and I think there was a language barrier as well from reading some of the captions, some of the write-ins afterwards. But anyway, so Antonio Noki is going out to work with this guy. They're in Japan. And the guy is just kind of no-selling all of Antonio Noki's stuff. And then if you'll watch at the 4 minute and 35 second mark, uh, great Antonio will start really just forming the shit out of Anoki's back of his neck and his trap area. It gives him about four really stiff shots. And Anoki has been the total pro up until this point. And at about that time, the savvy veteran and the tough guy that Anoki is and the leader of that company, boy, he fires back a couple of receipts, does a takedown, starts kicking in the great Antonio in the head, and it all turns uh, downhill for there for the great Antonio because he fucked with the wrong guy at the wrong time. Antonio Inoki was a real tough guy, and this guy was clearly trying to take advantage of him and clearly trying to make him look like an idiot. Antonio Inoki said, uh-uh, we ain't doing that shit. And he continues to kick him in the head, stomp on his head, and beat the fuck out of him. I didn't know that the insanely funny comedian Bill Burr had watched this same match, and he also does commentary on it. So he led a lot of people to watch this match I don't know how he found it, but watched Great Antonio versus Antonio Noki first, and then type in Bill Burr commentary, Great Antonio versus Antonio Noki, because that's some funny shit, the way you know Bill is, the way he breaks everything down, his take on it as well. But the original video, Great Antonio versus Antonio Noki, is a real clusterfuck, and it's one of the strangest matches that I think I've ever seen. And I'd never heard of the great Antonio. Nonetheless, it's something for, for you to watch and send me your feedback, what you thought you saw in that match, to my email account, questions at steveaustinshow.com. Anyway, hey man, the Broken Skull Challenge, it is over. We will see if we get to season five. In the meantime, I'm about to release about, shit, six more designs of the T-shirts I wore on that damn show on ProWrestlingTees.com, also on BrokenSkullRanch.com. Uh, my damn beer, Broken Skull IPA from El Segundo Brewing Company, is available at Whole Foods and Total Wines if you live here in California. Also, if you want to order it online, go to InsideTheCellar.com and see if they ship to your state. Hey, man, I appreciate y'all supporting the sponsors of the Steve Austin Podcast. They're the ones that let me do this for you free twice a week. So big thanks to DDP Yoga. Go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin to get 25% off all DDPY DVDs and related merch. To the books, 
Order flowers from books.com and use the promo code Steve to save 20% off your order. To Nature Box, go to naturebox.com slash Austin to get 50% off your first order. And, of course, to Amazon, who have been supporting this podcast since day one. And Amazon is the best place to get the cold steel broken skull knife. Just 75 bucks for the most badass pocket knife on the planet. And if you order the cold steel broken skull knife through my Amazon links, Amazon will kick back a couple of bucks to the podcast. It doesn't cost you anything extra. No hidden fees or charges. It just helps us pay the bills here at Podcast One, our production costs. You can find my Amazon links by going to podcastone.com, clicking on the Killer Deals button in the top right corner of the page, and then hitting the Steve Austin Show button. I got Amazon links for the USA, UK, and Canada. So that's podcastone.com. Click the Killer Deals button in the top right corner, then click on the Steve Austin Show, bookmark it so you can find it easier. Hey, it's the New England Patriots versus the Atlanta Falcons. Maybe we'll be talking a little bit of football after the Super Bowl. It's going to be an epic Sunday. I'm looking forward to seeing how this goes down. Do I have a favorite? God damn, on one hand, it'd be great to see Belichick and Brady win another Super Bowl ring. On the other hand, it'd be great to see uh, that Matt Ryan and all those Atlanta Falcons with that explosive offense and that goddamn that defense they got was kicking ass. So it's going to be an epic football game. I'm in the middle about who I want to win it. I'm a, a, a fan of Julio Jones. Matt Ryan's had a lights out year. I love what Tom Brady's done his whole career. Some people don't. I'm a big Bill Belichick fan. Dan Quinn has done an outstanding job in Atlanta. Hey, I just want to see a good game. So whoever wins for me, hey, I'm all down with it. I don't really have a favorite in this race. I'm just looking forward to seeing a damn good game. Hope it's a close one. Hope it's a nail biter. We'll see how these matchups play out, and we'll see who wins the Super Bowl. Look forward to talking about it. Hey, keep listening to 60 Second AP News headlines coming up next. Until then, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. Download new episodes of Steve Austin Unleashed every Thursday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One right after this. The Angry President. I'm Rita Foley with an AP News Minute. We've learned that President Trump was seething when he fired FBI Director James Comey. He felt Comey let the FBI's Russia investigation play out in the press, we're told. Former Trump campaign advisor Roger Stone tells the Today Show this morning... The Trump presidential campaign did not collude with Moscow. The idea of Russian collusion is a canard. It's a falsehood. Earlier on the Today Show, White House Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders was asked about a line in the president's termination letter to Comey that read, I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I am not under investigation. Some have called that statement into question. Sanders was asked about it. Uh, look, I, I'm not sure on the, the reasoning behind that exact part being in there, but I do know uh, I spoke to the president directly, and he said that those uh, moments and conversations did take place. I'm Rita Foley.